Thank you all so much for being here. I am so, so, so excited to see so many people attending and so grateful to have our panelists here tonight to talk about pathways in film and television and media production, which I know so many of you have questions about. My name is Arianne Baker. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the advisor for careers in arts and media. And selfishly, I'm very excited to be here as I was formerly in the uh, film industry as a second assistant camera. So truly, I am so excited to have you all here. Um, again, this will be a recorded session, so you'll be able to refer back to this later, which is also why you won't be able to turn on your camera or unmute yourselves. But if you do have questions for our panelists, please put them in the chat. I would love to read those off and really hear the types of things that y'all are, are wondering about. So I'm going to let our wonderful panels introduce themselves and um, I would invite you to just kind of briefly introduce yourself and tell us all a little bit about your current professional role. So Leah, do you want to get us started? Um, sure thing. Um, I'm a manager. I'm a talent manager at Illumination Entertainment. Uh, we make the Minions movies and um, my role right now is not um, specifically production. It's more about um, tracking everybody in production and all of the personnel, but I have worked in production for almost two decades and at Warner's and Disney and Sony and now Illumination. Awesome, thanks. Hey, Janice, you want to jump in? Sure. Um, I, I'm Janice Vogel and I uh, use she, her pronouns and I am a film editor and I've had um, various roles in production and post-production um, throughout my career. I most recently edited the show Z-Way for Showtime. Um, and I'm sure I'll get to, to say more as we go along. Thanks. And bring us home, Jen. Hi, everyone. I'm Jen. Um, I am most likely, I guess, a documentary filmmaker. I've been um, doing a lot of different formats, but I feel like most of my work has been in documentary films. I just sold a docu-series, which is going to be about food and history. So that will be my next big project. And I just literally right before this submitted um, my Sundance Catalyst application for fiction feature that I've been co-writing and hopefully will co-direct with my husband um that we've been working on for like four years oh. wow congratulations i know it was one of those you weren't even sure if you were going to be able to attend so you're like i have this thing i'm finishing up i'll let you know so i'm so glad you were able to join us and again thank you everyone for being here i think one of the the biggest questions that i hear from students is really thinking about how to get started, how to even learn about all of the different options. Because I think having all of you here really showcases the wide range of roles and experiences and different directions that you can go within production as an industry. And so could you all um, share one thing that really helps you explore all of the different options kind of in the industry, especially as you're looking at your options, you know, early in your wealthy experience or at some point while you were a student? And I'll kind of open it up to anyone who wants to jump in first. Well, um, my my love for film uh, really like blossomed at Wellesley College. I I I wasn't never thought I'd be in the film industry before I um, went to Wellesley, and it wasn't till like my junior year when I decided to take a experimental um, video art class with Anne Sternagel. I don't know if she's still there, but um, taking this experimental video class like really blew my mind. And um, I did a couple internships. One of them was like at, Ameri uh, at uh, American Public Television. And um, I just like sort of understood the impact of, of film and how it sort of uh, could pull in all of my various passions. I, I had been a photographer and um, I was studying uh, international relations and I just wanted to like have something that could pull all of my various passions into one place. Um, and and so I really set out on a path to become a cinematographer and 
uh, came up on some like very big, like patriarchal roadblocks to that path. Um, yeah, uh, very, very terrible experiences. And I'm really, really impressed by all of the female cinematographers that are putting themselves out there now. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's interesting, you know, sometimes we, when we don't know a lot about film, it's like all about the director, or all about the writer, or all about the cinematographer even. I feel like those three roles are like, get a lot of credit. Um, and so when you're watching the credits for a movie and you just see the hundreds and hundreds of roles that are involved, um, it's so important to take that into account and to know that like whatever your talents are and interests are, like there's a very specific niche in film that might grab you or surprise you along the way. Um, I fell in love with editing uh, in the editing suites at Wellesley College. It was like the place where I lost myself in something um, and you know, just didn't know what time it was and what I was doing, but it was just like that editing suite in that building was just like my home. And I never thought like, oh, I can do this as a career. I thought like, oh, editing is way too much fun. I have to do something like hard and scary. Um, and so I started like as a, well, I started as a secretary and then became a producer and like just found this like very like, oh, you're great with people, just become a producer. And I am very impressed by producers, but it was interesting to have my career sort of pigeonholed in a very stereotypical, like feminine um, way. And really when I started producing with editors, I was like, ooh, I like working with editors, but I think I'd rather be the editor. Um, and it was really like this, like, oh, I can be myself as an editor. I can be as weird. It's like currency to be weird as an editor. So um, yeah, I really found my, found my home there again in the edit suite. It's always so interesting. It's like the things that you're like, oh, I'm so self-conscious about this. And then it's like, oh, wait, that's my superpower. Like that's my strength. And people, I think, especially in, in creative industries can appreciate those things where it's like, oh, you're different. We need different. Like, come on in. We need more of that. And I think it's such a beautiful thing about the industry that maybe isn't so apparent in other ones. Mm -hmm. Nice. Did you edit on Media 100, Janice? I didn't. What is that? <laughs> oh, never mind. Um, when I was at Wellesley, that was like the editing suite. And after I graduated, I was like, oh, yeah, I know how to edit on Media 100. And no one knew what system that was. Mm. <laughs> and yeah, had to no, learn, like, other systems. <laughs> I started on uh, Final Cut Pro. Mm -hmm. um, and now I work primarily on Avid. And sometimes people twist my arm to work in Premiere, which I think is amazing when you're making something that can exist just in the world of your own computer. But um, the sort of bigger shows, uh, the, the way that you can work with a team on Avid, even remotely, is um, more seamless. And yeah, so much. <laughs> <to say. laughs> um, I, can, I can jump in. Um, when I was at Wellesley, I really thought I was going to be a therapist. That's why I was a psych major. And then um, all my friends were nerds, or maybe the whole school, and everyone was do like doing double majors. And I was barely um, passing psychology. <laughs> and I was like, I need like fun classes. I wasn't even really thinking of like CAMS as like a career. I think I just wanted to pick classes that I knew I would have fun in that would help elevate my GPA. <laughs> And, and it did, but really it was because I was so into it and I was like spending all my time again, like in the editing room, like just like um, picking up my camera and to filming whatever was happening on campus. And I did take this one course by Elena Kreef, which I think she may still teach hopefully. Um, it was called like Asian American Women in American Film and TV History or something like that. And I was like, wait, I didn't even know, first of all, that there was a history worth of Asian American films. And this was back in like 2000, I think I took her class in 2002. So it was like way less documentaries and media out there by the, back then. 
And I remember watching those documentaries and um, like while I consider myself Asian American, I also was born in South America and lived there for a bunch of years. So I was trying to find my own identity through media and through this class. And it really made me feel like, well, there are all these other people who are not doing the stereotypical like Asian American career. Maybe I can just kind of start doing it as a hobby and see where it goes. Um, but then after I graduated Wellesley and, you know, I did have a higher GPA with my CAMS double major <laughs> like, and slowly I realized my psych major, like it, it's never going to happen for me. I'm never going to be a therapist because I'm really bad at listening to people and I just love talking. So when I got to LA, um, it took me a long time to really form my passion for filmmaking into like the next step. Right. So for like five years. I was like doing other stuff. Like I was in fashion for a really long time, working on my family business, going and just like learning other things. And because I was an international student, I had to keep going to school in order to stay in the US. So I went and got like a lot of associate's degrees and a bunch of things I will never probably use. And then finally, like five years later, I was like, I think I'm ready to take this more seriously and enroll in an MFA program, which is also like a huge debt thing. Like. I don't really suggest that <laughs> unless you really have to. For me personally, it was um, it was something that like really cemented the fact that I wanted to make film my career. But again, I don't really know that many people who did that, even like from the people who I work with. So I highly suggest not doing that unless you can and not take on student loans. Um, but I think my time at, so I went to USC film school. I think my time at USC did help me a lot, but I also like, again, back to the whole patriarchy and film, there were so, it was like, there was like so many lessons even before we went out into the field during film school that I was like, oh God, this is just going to be worse when we get out there. Um, and yes, it was, it is worse <laughs> when you get out there. <laughs> um, I got into documentary filmmaking because I thought there would be more women in documentary and um, that is true, but it's still not enough. And there were many times that like Janice, like what you were talking about when we're on sets, even if it's like a mostly women crew, it, it like the one guy would be the only person that would be heard about a lot of things or like that person would just automatically be assumed to be the leader of the project when they're like a PA. So <laughs> there were a lot of moments like that, um, but I'm sure we'll get into that. Yeah. Great. I, um... I had, I had very similar experiences. Um, I love hearing about just being at Wellesley. I miss it so much. And just finding your niche and being able to lose yourself because I think that's really what, what you wanna find and learn and really go deep within while you're at Wellesley um, so that you can take that with you and keep that with you when you're out in the world because um, you are gonna come up against um, forces of opposition. So you need to strengthen and build yourself, your vision of yourself, your, your purpose in life. Um, while you can in this beautiful safe space that is Wellesley College. Um, I was lucky enough that I knew that I wanted to study theater um, when I came in and um, I was able to direct, you know, three plays on the stage while I was there. Um, absolutely loved it. I was part of um, the the Wellesley, you know, I don't, it was theater board at the time. I don't know what it's called now. Um, and then I was part of Shakespeare Society. And um, <clears throat> my best friend is you know, my friend from Shakespeare. So, um, and this is, we're, we're talking 30 years later. So um, keep and build and grow those, um, those interests, those loves, these are still lifelong gloves of my, you know, my own. Um, and also really trying to build as much as you can at Wellesley because that, because the outside world will take notice. Like that's, you know, you've got two people on this panel that went to USC film school. That is no small feat because um, they, they, they recognize that the quality of a Wellesley education. So, um, the way to stand head and shoulders above someone who like you know you're competing against because everybody is like it's your
my, well, make what you're doing your, like your life. Jump into it. Um, be curious. Do do the crazy thing. Let your geek flag fly. Like you say, it's, um, so I was like, I was theater, but I was also a, a Greek and Latin major. So I was part of like the classics club and we put on plays in ancient Greek while I was there, um, you know, which is pretty amazing. There are things that, that are open and available to you right now that are not available to probably 1% of the entire world right now. So recognize it, exploit it, try something, and do it for a couple of weeks. You don't like it, put it down. Like I tried, I tried drawing when I was at Wellesley and then it's, I didn't take it up until I went to work at Disney and now it's a lifelong passion, but it wasn't for me back then. So um, also keep learning because we can tell you all about the industry and, and how we found our first jobs and how we got, you know, got into film school, how it, how it helped us, how it didn't help us. And then, you know, the first jobs. But the thing is that the industry is always changing, um, especially animation. There is a, there's, there's a revolution in animation almost every four years. When I started, we were drawing on paper. People were like, we had wagons. They had like those little red wagons that we would, we would like trail, trail all the way through the hallways and the, the um, scenes were in stacks. Um, you know, that's, that's long gone. And then, uh, and then, you know, then the whole CT revolution took over and now, you know, everybody wants to go back to 2D, which is pretty amazing. So um, I would say like, keep your ear to the ground, but like keep really close to your heart and know who you are. Um, you are gonna come up against me too moments the hierarchy, the patriarchy. I mean, it's, I call it the hierarchy because there are, there are women who are just as sexist as men, you know? Um, people are always going to look at you and and they're, they're gonna underestimate you. And it's just so fun to surprise them. <laughs> and that's, that's what you do. You keep, your, you keep your confidence and you just keep exploring what you love. And, it's in a lot of ways, being the woman, being the underestimated person is like, it gives you a lot of leeway. A lot, you know, because they, they, don't, they don't have the same expectations. So you can just be like, oh, I could try this and I could try that. And then all of a sudden you have all this great knowledge. It's like, oh yeah, Leah knows all about that. Let's go back to her. I've had that happen a lot. And I think you touched on kind of, it's a perfect transition into my next question where Sometimes it's the, you know, the topics or certain majors at Wellesley that students say, like, I'm really interested in this. I'm going to learn a lot about it. But oftentimes what I get asked about is kind of how do I get started in this industry if I don't have those traditional film school skills, if this isn't something that I'm necessarily learning early on. And so my, my question for all of you is really thinking about that kind of experience cycle that you need experience in order to get the job, but you can't get the job because you need experience. And, and thinking about what your wealthy education gave you as a foundation, but also how you supplemented and found those necessary skills to get some of those first opportunities and get some of those first um, experiences. Well, I can, I can only say this, that I think that as far as filmmaking goes, you can, you can learn those skills on the job, but you can't, you can't build like your base of knowledge, like your complete self um, within like a film school paradigm. Like I, I, when I was at USC, I don't know what it's like now, but it was just, it was like a bloodbath. I mean, I remember coming out of it and meeting a friend like afterwards and talking to him, he's like, oh, wow, you're actually nice. <laughs> you know, um, so I would say the, the more important thing is um, when, you, when you're looking for that first job, when, when we're interviewing people and we don't, you know, people can just have high school degrees and still, you know, come in and work in animation. Um, you can work, there is, there is an actual like progression from PA to producer in animation. And many of the producers in animation are women. If you look, just look up this 
this fact, the producer who has made the most box office ever in all time is a woman. Her name is Darla Anderson and she works for Pixar. So just keep that in mind. But that, so that that's why I had, I stayed in animation. I was like, there are female role models here. There are people that I respect. There's there's a not, not like, cause I dealt with a lot of the issue stuff and I just did not want to have to him. You know. And also there is an openness to different ways of living, different ways of being. When you work with artists every day, it's like it opens up your life completely. So, um, but if you're looking for that first job in animation, you apply for a PA job, you show up and and you just show like how much you love what you want to do. So, you know, no matter what job. And also you, you want them to look at you and be like, I would love to come into the office and, and see this person every day. This person would really make my day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would also say, like, I'll just speak specifically to documentary since that's where I'm always at, living in whatever, <laughs> surrounded by. Um, so much of documentary filmmaking is not being on set. Like, I don't know if I would have known that when I was a Wellesley student. Uh, most independent documentaries take six years to make. And most of those six years is me behind the computer, like submitting to grants which I'm so glad when I was at Wellesley, I was part of so many student orgs where we were doing grant proposals. Like that skill really came in handy because that was like one of my biggest producerial skills that I was able to transfer from Wellesley to being a producer. Um, the other thing is like all my investment banker friends from Wellesley, they're like, wait, what? Like you stare at an Excel sheet all day. Like they think it's, you know, a total lie. But no, I like know how to do formulas now, like things like that. Like I would have never thought I would be such a pro at Excel. Um, I don't want to be, but I have to be. And I think depending on what kind of experience you want, like if you want set experience, like of course being a PA on set, like an onset PA, that will give you the most experience doing that. If you want to be in documentaries, like, like your long-term goal, like someone just messaged me here, like your long-term goal is to make a feature documentary. Um, you can just intern for a documentary film. Like we're always looking for interns. But going into it, just know that most of that work is not going to be on set. Yeah, yeah, I think that's such a valid point, and it's something that um, we I've talked with the CAMS department um, and with the faculty to really think about what what opportunities are students really looking for, and what aren't they even thinking about as potential opportunities within kind of what we call production. But there's yeah, there's on set production, and then there's the pre production and post production aspects of that. And then there's everything else. And I think, you know, um, like someone mentioned, I think Janice, you might have been the one to mention it, um, watching the credits at the end of a movie. You see all of those opportunities and then really think about, wow, I can be a part of this industry without it being kind of what we expect when we see, you know, behind the scenes of the, I always think about like on DVDs, it's like, oh, you watch the behind the scenes footage. That's an option. But it's such, it's one part of the option where you really do have so much where if your strength is in research or if your strength is in, you know, numbers, you can still be in this industry, even if you don't necessarily see yourself being on set all the time. And I think that's such a crucial thing to remember, especially with something like documentaries. There's still so much of that work behind the scenes that really anyone can be involved if they just decide kind of what aspects they want to focus on. Yeah, the other thing that that I would recommend, like as far as trying to find a first job, is um, actually reach out to your heroes, like um, send fan emails. I mean, I've done that, and I, I've had I've had people, you know, link to me on LinkedIn and stuff. And and of course, like if if someone asks me for advice, I'm going to give them advice. Like it's it's especially if like you're interested in animation. That I don't think there's any artists, like any, even like the directors who would not respond to an email. Like people are, they just love it. It's, and you know, I'm sure it's, it's true in live action as well, but I can only speak to animation, but um, you know, it's an art form that we want to keep living in this world and that we love and it's given so much to us that we want to give back, so. Totally, when we're obsessed with something sometimes we think well everybody is obsessed with this or like if I you know if you want something you're going to think like well everybody wants this so 
I can't do it. I've heard that so many times. I'm actually, um, I have a side hustle as a life coach. Um, and one thing my clients often say is like, well, you know, I really, you know, want this career, but like, doesn't everybody? Um, and I'm like, no, everybody doesn't. Uh, <laughs> and other things, but um, yeah, that's, that's so true. And I, you know, I also wanted to echo that, like, being pleasant to be around without being inauthentic, like being authentically yourself and like connecting with human beings is like, I, I get imposter syndrome a lot, like working on it on a job, like, am I gonna get do this edit? Am I gonna, you know, but I am confident that people are going to enjoy working with me because I'm responsive and I love what I'm doing and I have, you know, ideas and I want that um, energy of collaboration. Um, and I, you know, I know that I'm hired because of my experience and my um, talent, but I know even more so that people just enjoy working with me. And so that's super important and um, a really easy thing to sort of cultivate with just loving yourself and then connecting with other humans. Um, I wanted to talk about internships a little bit because I think like it's one of those things where junior year, it's like you go out in the real world and get your internship. And I remember just like searching through all the internships and like having very random internships. I had like one in an anti-slavery organization and then one at um, the public broadcasting um, corporation. Um, and I just want to sort of like, internships were great for gaining experience, but at, after my like fifth internship, I realized like I wasn't available to work at the end of it because I was going back to school. And if I could do that over again, I would really like do a few less internships and know that like the intern, my last internship, which led to me working as a, um, as like the receptionist in the post house. Um, that was the internship that I needed. It, before I took that internship, I was like, I'm too good for internships. Like I'm done. I deserve to be like paid and respected. And I, I believe that as well, but I hadn't taken an internship where I was actually available to work. And so I did this internship and then was given an opportunity at the end. So I'd say really weigh your internships um, wisely and, and maybe hold off until you can really be available after the internship, I'd say. Um, it's really important to like cultivate your obsessions and like watch a lot of films. And what I'll say along with that is like every single film and every single show and every single piece of media you watch has entry level positions on it. So, you know, there's like this, this, um, way of doing, you know, people encourage you sometimes to say yes to everything. Like all you gotta do is say yes. And I would just play devil's advocate with that advice and say, if you have the privilege and like the financial stability to hold out for the things that you actually want. And like Leah said, like reach out to the films that you and the people on that are working on things, even if you're not sure if that's the direction you wanna go, like reach out to people who work on things that resonate with you don't think like oh well I'm gonna have a learning experience on this like low budget commercial um even though I really want to be working in animation sometimes we pivot to the thing we don't want to do because we don't think we deserve to do the thing we really want to do when other people are doing the same thing in the opposite direction and so it's just yeah really important to have that um that self-worth to say like, ooh, I wanna work on this kind of thing or these five kinds of things and um, try to say no to everything that doesn't fit into that category until you, um, you know, get that one that you want and, you know, use your energy wisely to, to really um, 
get get what you want, I would say that, yeah, I'll save. I, I have I have some tools to save for later questions. Sure, and I think that's always something I try to impart on students as well as you know an email, especially I think now in our digital age, it's really easy to just send an email. Just send the email. If they respond, amazing. You can have an incredible conversation, ask all your questions and potentially have these opportunities. And if they don't respond, okay, you send the next email. You try again, your day continues, your life goes on. And I think it's such an important reminder of that is like, sometimes you just have to try. You just have to send the email, ask the question, see what happens without that feeling of, oh, I have to, I have to wait. Like, I'm not good enough for that yet. I have to, you know, wait or do that next thing before I can even start that process. And so I think that's such a helpful reminder for really everybody in any industry. Nice. And really, I think, again, that's such a big component of, of film and media in general is that networking component. And I think that's something that people talk about so often, but isn't always like at the forefront of like, this is what you need to be doing is reaching out and making those connections. And so how would you all say you've really utilized both the, the Wellesley community and the, the Wellesley alum network, in addition to your professional networks to, to kind of navigate all of the different facets and, and steps along the way? Um, after graduating Wellesley, I um, decided to just move to LA for a few months and do some internships and work on set. Um, and my like first step was like getting a couple internships lined up. And my second step was like reaching out to all the alumni in LA um, through the alumni network and trying to find a place to live. Um, so I did find like two places to live for consecutively for the, for the three months I was out there through like either directly through a Wellesley alum or a, a friend of a friend of a Wellesley alum. And that was, that was um, pretty cool. Um, and I can say more about this later, but I'm the, um, I founded an organization called the Blue Collar Post Collective, which um, has like 15,000 members worldwide on Facebook. And it's an organization that, uh, supports emerging talent in post-production, but also allows membership from production and all areas of media creation. Um, and yeah, you can find out more about that. I can uh, make sure you, you get links to just join on Facebook. And I really, I actually steer away from even using the word networking. I, I, I call it community building because mm -hmm. I'm so like excited about the connections that I make that my route has really been like friendship and like, you know, most of my jobs have been word of mouth. And so um, just building that community and having friends who think of me for work, um, that's been, that's been my life. When it's your life, it's not networking, you know? I love that. I feel like I need that like on the wall in my office for everybody. It's like, it's not networking, it's community building. Mm -hmm. Don't be scared of it. It's a fun thing when you kind of reimagine what that it's not just transactional, like you are creating relationships. I think that's so beautiful. Yeah, I, I agree with Janice. And also, I think like in the very beginning when I was networking, I was doing the thing that everybody does where they go up to someone that they want to talk to and they're like, "Ooh, tell me everything about your life and how do I get to where you are? And then slowly I started realizing I started getting good at networking when I was the one giving someone else um, connections. So it wasn't about like me getting something from someone, but I was the one offering like, oh, hey, like you work in blah, blah, blah. Like I know someone who can help you. Like I just did that. I just came back from Milwaukee Film Festival. We had all these filmmaker happy hours and this person from Milwaukee was going to move to LA and she's a puppeteer and I was like oh my god I know someone who works in puppeteering who you should probably have brunch with and it wasn't even about like me wanting to learn puppetry which I don't you know because I'm not going to be good at it but it's just like using that networking skill reverse like trying to find how do I connect this person I just met to someone else I know from my network and it, I think that's part of that community building aspect of it when you do that like it doesn't feel like um, 
like I'm gaining something from that transaction, right? And then later on, I think the relationship builds up differently. Like if she moves to LA, she meets my friend, it goes well. We all have brunch together. We're all friends. We all keep each other in mind when we work on new things. So I think it just becomes more organic that way too. Yeah, totally. Leah, any thoughts? Um, about networking? Yeah. Um, my advice is talk to strangers. I think that you like I love talking to you. I used to be really shy I used to be like oh no, no I'm not at this I'm not at that and then um and my other advice is move to LA because I think like if you want to be making movies or just go where you want to make movies because like they make movies almost everywhere now but um I think that like, if you're if you want to have like you know an, an animation experience um move to LA and then talk to strangers you would be amazed at the people that you know you just sit next to in a coffee shop and you just compliment them on oh that would cute scarf you're wearing and then you start a conversation and you say and you, you say oh you know I, I work in animation and it's like oh they know 10 other people and this and that and da, da, da. and um and everybody is it seems to be pretty helpful I mean I I've not really ever come across anyone who's just like no I'm not going to help you or no I'm not going to talk to you and you know like you just don't talk to them then but um but but you know know who you are be open be friendly talk to strangers yeah yeah i think they're not, they're not strangers really right just, and it's it's so interesting how those connections lead to some of those goals because my initial you know path into the industry was because I was working on a student film and someone I was working with said, you remind me so much of this other woman that I've worked with, you have to meet. Like you need to meet, you're too similar. And she ended up becoming like my mentor and the person who got me all of my jobs and we became super close and it's true, like we were really similar. But it's so fascinating how it can just be that one connection that just finally says, hey, you need to meet this person. Yeah, you, you need to meet this person. Or, oh, you would love talking to this person, or I just had this conversation, and how much that can open. That I think you're right. Sometimes it's just talking to someone, saying, "Hey, this is what I'm interested in. I can't wait to hear what you're interested in, and just mm -hmm. how that all connects." Because it's a big industry, but it's not that big of an industry. There's so many connections and so many people who who know one another that those yeah can yeah really be powerful. And then the other the other thing that I struggled with just starting to come out of Wellesley, and maybe just because I'm. I just, I, I was a more in your head type of person was, I just had a hard time with just talking and just like being in the moment. Like I was, I was always overthinking. I mean, I still overthink everything, but like even, but that back then it just like stopped me. Like, I was just like, whoa, I don't know what to say. I don't know. Da, da, da. And it's like, just anything. Like you can't say anything wrong. <laughs> it's like people don't, you know, they just, they just want to connect with you. It's not, they're not judging you, um, but it's just like that basic stuff that if you just can just like somehow calm yourself down, calm them down, like it's it becomes this really great moment that they'll remember and they will remember you the next time that they see you. Yeah, absolutely. And just to mention the like darker side of that coin, it's like yeah. do pivot when you are met with people who are toxic or abusive in any way. Um, my, my, my first internship in LA was creepy um, and I stuck it out and oh my gosh, this guy had a rug that I wasn't allowed to walk on that he took his conference calls on and he, you know, I just, I stuck it out because I thought I couldn't burn a bridge. It's my first industry job. Like I can't burn this bridge. And I realized that like, you can't burn a bridge with toxic people because usually they have that reputation in the in the industry at large. Or, but ultimately, you, there there are so many other avenues and so many other people, and you are never burning a bridge by like taking care of yourself and moving towards people who you feel comfortable connecting with and good connecting with. So always, you know, listen to that. Yeah. Oh yeah, there's a lot of abuse in the industry. There's like, yeah, that's how I ended up in the animation was that, you know, I mean, I was, I worked for a woman who went to Wellesley, who was an abusive boss. 
So you just, you have to, that's when you look into yourself and you're just like, this is a large world and I can do this anywhere. And I'm, I'm not going to like, you know, crawl into the shell that she wants me to be in. So bye. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, you know, for us, um, when we look at all the relationships we did burn a bridge with, I don't think any of us regret it. Like we had so much uncertainty leading up to the burning of the bridge, but once we did it, we felt so good and so relieved and we don't care anymore if that bridge is burned. So I think there's always that uncertainty leading up to it, but there's Mm -hmm. never any regrets after. And like Janice said, it always ends up like karma, you know, like it always comes back into toxic people get exposed in some way or another. Oh yeah. My ex-boss got fired like a few months later. Wow. She's now a psychologist. (laughs) Wait, she is now a psychologist? Yes. Oh my God. (laughs) I feel like I have so many questions just about that, but we won't get into that. I know, I should should write a a movie about this. (laughs) Exactly, it's your next script. And I think, again, I think we've, we've touched on this or we've kind of talked about it, but I think it, it can be an industry that has definitely challenges or unexpected challenges that maybe isn't something that you initially thought of going into it. And so have there, I guess the answer is yes, but have there been situations or challenges you didn't expect, but on the other side, how did you handle it? What were some of the strategies or, or who were some of the people that you really found helped you navigate those challenges when they happened? I was really shocked the first time that someone underestimated my intelligence. Um, that really got me. I was just like, you really think I'm that stupid? So, um, and my ammunition is always just to be like completely overprepared. So maybe not the healthiest thing. Um, and I do tend to be a workaholic, um, but I was, I, I always think through all of the angles before I go into any situation and it's, it's always, it served me well. So I was in a position today where I um, had a call from a producer and um, she had sort of led up with emails about a project that seemed really up my alley to some degree. Um, But she ended up wanting me to work for three weeks for $1,500. Um, And, you know, said that she, you know, her, that was her budget and she didn't want to ask for more from that, uh, from that client. And um, I'm, you know, absolutely declining the, the job. Um, But my actual point is like, I take every meeting and I just go through the meeting, I listen, I say nice things about myself. <laughs> and then I tell them, I told her, you know, I'll, I'll shoot you an email tomorrow. And then tomorrow, you know, I'll decline. But um, the connection is there. And, you know, I think, um, I think money is a really important like topic to just get uh, you know, a lot of dialogue about and around, even in interning now, like in this decade, you should be paid for, um, there's there, like unpaid internships shouldn't be a thing anymore. Um, but yeah, that is just to say, I take every meeting and then I, and then I decline later on. Um, and I felt like I had some other point, but I'm, it's slipping up, it's slipping my mind right now. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't know if I have a better example. This is just an example that keeps coming back to my head, but once I was um, directing a musical and this male PA was fire watching and I was near him eating my lunch because I was trying to set up the next shot and he asked me what my role was on, on, the, sorry on the musical that he was hired to PA on. And I was like, I'm the director. And he was like, oh, I didn't realize you were a director. And I was like, oh no. 
no. Don't ever be that person. Because I think anybody can be that person, not just like this random guy who was also my classmate. But the fact that like, just going back to Leah and the underestimation, it's like, that's secretly how people always think about you. And sometimes it gets blurted out. And sometimes they do a very good job in hiding it. And it doesn't even matter, like, at the end of the day, like, he wasn't welcome back on my set, you know, <laughs> and, um, and I didn't have any regrets about that. Um, but I think that there's, there's a lot more control and power you have as an artist. Um, and also just even if you're early on, like, before you even work on other people's projects, you, you can be your own director, your own artist in the story that you want to tell. A lot of my, um, cause I did production, Leah, I don't know if you did the production program at USC. Yeah, so most of my classmates and I, we all um, majored cause you can pick which track you wanna do. We, we all did directing and like one other track which was like the money making one. Like, so you'd be a director slash sound person, director slash editor, director slash producer, which is what I did. And, um, and everyone just like, you know, like we were all hoping that after we graduated, we'd all get to direct. None of us are actually directing it you know, unless we make those opportunities for ourselves. But so many of my friends ended up going into screenwriting who didn't even like major in screenwriting. And USC has a whole other program for screenwriters, which my husband actually did, right? So they didn't even go through that program, but they were like, I'm just gonna go into screenwriting because it's like the cheapest, fastest way for me to get my ideas on paper where I am like the sole like author of it. And um, of course, you know, once you get into a writer's room that you have to collaborate and stuff, but when you have nothing and you have no money, you have no equipment, you're out of film school, you're in like so much debt, like how do you get your creative energy out? And there's always some category or some way that can be your place where you could create stories. As long as you can find a platform where you can create your stories and you have ideas for good stories, you are going to be able to make it. If you have no ideas and you have no stories, you can still be in this industry because we need a lot of support for yeah. the artists who do have those ideas and want to create those stories. It's a that whole industry. That's great, great advice. Yeah. That's awesome advice. I actually took, believe it or not, I took the documentary track when I was Oh, awesome. Thing. Me too. <laughs> and I, wor I worked in, this, in, this, in the sound department. I was one of the sound geeks and loved. Awesome. But I was, uh, for the doc, I was um, a cinematographer and um, sound editor. Was Mark Harris still there when you were yes. there? Awesome, yeah, he yes, was, I was like, like um, Doe Mayer was her. Oh yeah, yeah. She would, I essayed for yeah. her, essay is like TAing. <laughs> and it's crazy because like the people who were, you know, in my MFA program, very few actually went into the industry and quote unquote made it. And the one, uh, the one, who, you know, like the, the guy who did, he actually, wanted to get into narrative um but he ended up doing some really great documentaries and now and now he's finally getting to do some narrative stuff um he just did the billy eilish one oh, cool. rj rj color so but it, it takes years oh. the other thing is like you if you want to become a director it takes years like just you know it takes years to learn the craft the craft itself is just like it takes years to to you know master and then it takes years to like, you know, establish yourself and get up there. So be patient with yourself. Yeah, let that time table be mm -hmm. something that keeps your goals reasonable and like allows you to play and be a, have a playground, not feel like, oh, I'm 25 and what am I doing with my life? Um, you know, yeah, I, I think my parent, you know, wanted me to be like on the poster. Um, you know, the year after graduating from college. And um, it's taken some time to like, you know, detach from, you know, what my parents um, thought that going into the film industry meant and just my own timeline. Like I have, uh, when people ask if I'm, I made a, I, okay, I'll, I'll back up. And I went to, I had an MFA um, from City College of New York. So I did um, go to film school uh, with a lot less debt because <laughs> um, it's a public school in New York City and I really wanted to make films in New York City. So um, I, made a, I made a film through my program and 
you know, afterwards it was like, okay, this is your calling card in the industry. Now go make more movies. Um, and people ask me sometimes like, are you gonna make another movie? And I'm like, maybe when I'm 50, I'll have, uh, you know, something I wanna share on that like scale in that format. Um, so yeah, I like to give myself a lot of time. I really said to myself like, oh, I wanna know, you know, which area of film I want to land in by the time I'm, I think I set my goal at 30. Um, yeah, and I've, I've been a camera person, I've been a producer, I've been a front desk person, I've been a camera assistant, I've um, produced, I think I said that already, but yeah, just trying out a lot of things. And the other thing that I wanted to say about money is that um, I've only ever been respected more for asking for more money. And sometimes I, I am turned down. They say, oh, well, I can't pay you more. And I have the option to then leave or say, well, I'm happy to take a pay cut because I either love you or love the project. Um, but there's this myth that if you ask for money, you'll either price yourself out or they'll be like, how dare you ask for money? And it's, it's just been such a cool thing to like be seen as a, more of an equal at, or respected for my work every time I've um, asked for more money or declined work that isn't paying the rate. And I think it's such a, a helpful, again, reminder of sometimes you have to walk away from those things. Sometimes it's not gonna be a good fit for you and your priorities and your expectations where Absolutely, you can decide, is this project worth it for me for the person or the project itself or even the experience early on, but knowing that sometimes it is worth the walking away if it's not going to serve you in those things. And I think, again, that's an important reminder for especially students as they're getting started to really make that determination to say, is this worth it for me for my goals and the things that I'm hoping to achieve or is it like not? I got an email the other yeah. day, I haven't been in the industry for five years. Um, or more now, oh gosh, more, um, from someone who said, hey, like, can you come be a PA for us for no money? And I was like, you got, I used to be like a union second assistant camera. Like what is happening that you yeah. would think that that's even an option? And so I think it's so important to know what your priorities are, what your expectations are, because they're going to ask for the bare minimum. So you have to be able to really say, this is what I am expecting. Mm -hmm. and being able to walk away if it's not going to work for you. Oh, yeah. And I, I think this is where it's important to have to build a community of friends around you in the industry, also to have a mentor so that, that you, you know, you should build this within yourself. But sometimes it's like it gets a little wobbly. I don't know if it's society or whatever, but like you need someone to remind you, you know, of your worth. And it's I, I remember like I talked through someone that I work with um, she was afraid to ask for a, a, a raise. And you know, I was just like, listen, this is how much I make. Like, mm -hmm. And she ended up like, she's, she's now, she went from, you know, she started as an intern. She's now an associate producer, but you know, it's just, it's because like, she was not, she was not going to settle for what they were offering her. And it, and we're, and she was talking with, you know, our, um, head of you know business that who was a woman I mean it's like but it's it comes down to business you know it's like um when and you just you can't take it personally when they try to lowball you it's it's all a part of the give and take and the you know the economics of it but you have to like be very clear about what your economic worth is and you know and but also like you know have a, a group of friends who are willing to share the information and she you know share like where the what, where jobs are opening up here? Oh, look, there there might be like I I had I had a friend say, hey, you need to apply for this job now, um, and that was the only way that I got um, a promotion because they they tend to I don't know if it's with women or men or whatever, but like they you you get into a situation, especially you're a Wellesley woman, you're gonna kill that situation, right? You do that, and then they only see you like that. They don't like you know so it's like you have to you have to 
groom uh, my my thing is you groom the next person like the person who's like your pa or someone they need to know as much as you do so that they can take your space so as you go up always share your knowledge mm -hmm. such great advice yeah, just from the beginning of what you said, like transparency, telling each other what you're making, mm -hmm. money should not be taboo. It's so great to just say that, hey, this is my rate. Um, I think on my Facebook group in the Blue Collar Post Collective, sometimes we're just like, what do you make? My um, co-founder does a rate survey every year of editor of all post professionals and you can just see what, what the going rate is in a lot of different states um, but, you know, mainly LA and New York. Um, so that transparency is so, so important. Yeah. yeah. I'm also part of a couple of groups that have these kinds of pay surveys. Um, Brown Girl, Brown Girl Dog Mafia. Are you part of that, Janice? Whoa. Brown Girls Dog Mafia, they have um, a really robust database. Like everyone in the doc space shares all their rates from like producers to editors to to camera operators, to DP edit, like everything. And then um, there's another group called Asian American Doc Network, which is for Asian American documentary filmmakers. And they also share a bunch of rate um, surveys out as well. I think it's really important to know what your rate is and what the market says your rate is. And because there are so many situations where like, you know, the person who is trying to hire you may not be as knowledgeable as you are. And it is a teaching moment. Like I've been interviewed for a position where I'm like, this is, a very low rate. I don't think this person who has a very good heart would intentionally lowball me. So then I would actually use that as a teaching moment and say like, hey, Milton, actually like a producer is usually paid this much. So if you would want to like rephrase your job description or whatever, you should. I've had a couple of times when I saw people post like my friends post on Facebook or whatever, like I'm looking for an editor. Again, Janice, same thing. It's like, I'm looking for an editor. I only have $2,000. It's like three months of work or something ludicrous like that. And I would gently DM them and be like, please take down your post. This is extremely like, <laughs> like bad, bad job description. No one who has experience editing is going to like say yes to this. Like you have to like be very realistic about what you're putting out there as well. And um, I do give some of these people benefit of the doubt because they have not researched the industry. Um, they have not researched what your rate is. They're just, they just have like, you know, $10,000 to make a project work and they're just trying to figure it out. But I think it's always like a good teaching moment to remind them that even though you're not going to hire me because I'm not going to take this job, I want you to know what like the actual rate should be. Yeah. I know we're at time. So I am aware that if some students need to run, I am going to ask one more question of you all because I, I just have to ask it. Um, one is if you're willing to stay in contact with students or have students reach out to you, if you wouldn't mind sharing either your email or your LinkedIn or whatever way they might contact you in the chat. I know there are probably lots who would love to continue talking with you all. Um, and my final question for you all that I just, I have to ask because it's my favorite question ever is if you were to pack a backpack for a student interested in pursuing the creative arts and or production, what is one thing that you would pack for them? And this can be literal or metaphoric, but what's one thing that you would put in the backpack? Okay, my one thing. I, I like I literally have like a list of like 12 things, All right? Things. But like I think that I think the one that really like hit me was um, an invisibility cloak. And that's so you can be unapologetic and avid as an observer of life, that it will help you to create your own space and that it will force you to listen. Yeah. Yeah. I love like that. Listen to, listen to like yourself, listen to everybody around you, what they're really saying to you, but also listen to the industry and where it's going and always try to keep a step ahead. Yeah. Wow. Okay, so we have an invisibility cloak. Anyone else? Mine was availability. Yeah. Um, seeing your availability as an asset and as currency and like knowing that saying no is saying yes to something more fitting for you. Yeah. Um, and not not uh, not listening to the fear mongers around you saying like but what are you doing like what are you doing what are you doing um 
know that you can either promote availability or make something up to give yourself the space you need um, while you have it because it's really valuable. Yeah, perfect. I would say if there's a tool that allows you to see yourself the way others see you, because I think we are our own worst enemies, the biggest obstacles in our lives are usually our own fears and our own imposter syndromes and our own misdirection and like vagueness of what we want. Um, but if you ask your best friend, you know, like, what do you think of me? Like, just let's listen to how they talk about you and just try to say those things to yourself every morning. Yeah. Thank you all. Again, I could keep going for hours and hours and hours. I have so many questions, but thank you all so much for being here. I know, I know you'll be hearing from our students, but truly thank you for your advice, your wisdom, everything, and for being here. Thank you to all of the students who were able to attend and even some of our faculty. Um, please reach out to the Career Ed Office if you have any questions, if you need the contact info for any of our panelists, um, or if you are looking to schedule an appointment with me to talk through any of this more, I am always available. So have a lovely rest of your night or evenings, and hopefully we will see you all again soon. Thanks. Bye, everyone. All right. Yeah. Godspeed to everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Keep in touch. Bye.